and welcome to The Thing About Golf, a podcast series from Golf Australia magazine where we explore what it is that draws people to this, the most maddening stick and ball game of them all. My name's Rod Murray and each month I'll be bringing you these entertaining talks with a broad cross-section of the golf community as we endeavour to answer that unanswerable question, what is The Thing About Golf? Over the coming months, we'll meet golfers who are famous and golfers who aren't. But what we guarantee about each and every one of them is that they will be interesting because that's the criteria to get the call from the thing about golf. On today's episode, we're going to meet a man whose name will be vaguely familiar to many through his relentless hard work to establish an Australian golf museum. Tom Moore is one of only 12 current life members of the PGA of Australia, and his time in golf has spanned everything from World War II to the birth of podcasting. As head professional at Muirfield and Rosnay Golf Clubs in Sydney from the 1950s through to the early 2000s, Tom has witnessed just about every imaginable significant change that the game has seen. It's this unique perspective that we chat about with Tom on a journey that eventually leads us to discover that for him, the thing about golf is its history and the less than ideal way that we as golfers treat it. I started the conversation with Tom by asking just how it was that he was first introduced to the game. A mate of mine said, Dad, I'd like to earn a few shillings. I said, yeah, we always need that. He said, well, I'm a caddy at Kalara, and they're looking for caddies. Mm-hmm. So come down next Saturday morning and we'll get your job. So down I went to Kalara and lined up there with the other caddies. How old were you at this stage, Tom? What age? At, uh, 12, I think. Okay. And did you know anything of golf? Did you know anyone who played golf at the time? or um, Not really, no. So you'd never played it yourself? No, you'd never owned not. some clubs? or Definitely not. Okay. No. So down I go, and uh, the first Saturday I earned uh, 14 shillings, dollar forty. Right. And uh, I went back on the Sunday and I got another dollar forty. <laughs> Right. Two dollars eighty, and my brother, who's older than me, he was an apprentice, and he was getting twenty-one shillings a week. Right. What sort of apprentice was he? What sort of industry? Uh, fitting and turning. Okay. Yeah. And um, so I started caddying, and as you can imagine, it was during the war, and golf balls were like hen's teeth. What year are we talking, Tom? What year would this have been? What's that? What year? What year was About this? About forties. Two forty three. Nineteen forty three, right in the middle of the war. Yeah. So you would yeah. really be feeling it. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, so, um, so so you it was, you started on weekends. Yeah. And how many how much did you get for a weekend for two days? It was two dollars eighty. It was decent then. It was it was right, yeah, it was decent. I money. used to go to school on a Monday morning and put, say, four shillings in my Commonwealth right. savings bank. Was that when I first started school, they used to bring the Commonwealth Bank would come around. Yep. And you, the kids would all line up and deposit money in the bank. So was that part of that program? Yeah, that's right. Wow. Four shillings. I, I was keen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's yeah. an early start to understanding finance and money, isn't it? Which I'm sure came in handy later on when you were a professional and running your own business. But yeah, that's an excellent grounding, isn't it? In, yeah. In money yeah. and how it works. So, um, so then I started swinging a club. And I went up to Asquith Golf Club and started playing there. And uh, what sort of age now were you when you I'm started? Coming to on to sixteen, seventeen. And that was the first time you sort of swung a club. Yeah, that's quite late, isn't it? Yeah, you it can, is. You think now? Yeah. To become a professional, if you didn't start, if you didn't that's pick right. up a club till you were sixteen. Most people <laughs> would tell you you've got no chance of becoming <laughs> a professional. Anyhow, um, I eventually got a set of clubs together and joined Asquith which was a nine-hole course then. Another rough course was out here at North Rocks. Mm -hmm. So one afternoon with a couple of fellas from North Rocks, we came out and played here. And it was only ten holes then, but it was rough as guts. But I could see that it had possibilities. This is the Muirfield Golf Club where we're recording this, and you have quite. We'll talk a little later about some of the links you've got with this golf club. That's Obviously, right. they go way back, and, um, all the way to there. Anyhow, I went on then to serve my apprenticeship with Don Spence and Ron Spring, who had a, um, a good golf nets in the National Building in Pitt Street. So in the city. In the city. So you did your apprenticeship in a shop. Yeah. 
Okay. And that was fairly common because um, most blokes worked five days or five and a half days a week, so they didn't get a lot of time for practice. But they could sneak round to one of the golf nets and hit a few balls in their lunch hour or something like that. That might have changed. I'm not sure there's any of that left. No, there used I to be. I don't know of any. No. So um, they were very good to me, and um, and while we were there. And while I was there, a fellow came in and said that he was the manager of the Barclay Golf and Country Club at North Rocks. Mm-hmm. And uh, he wanted the golf school to stock the shop. He would sell on a commission basis. And um, when I qualified as a pro, I'd get the job as teacher there. So, um, Were you still living at Hornsby at this stage, Tom? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not too far from here at North Rocks, is no. it? Uh, would have been a difficult journey without yeah, a car, I right, imagine, in those was. days. It really was. So, um, um, anyhow, I thought, well, um, I doubt if I'll get the job, but um, as it turned out, um, this bloke, Sid at Hammonds, his name was, he left the place in... Uh, early 1954, and by this time, locals had joined up at a, at a club which was called the North Rocks Golf Club, but there were a few expats, Scots around, and they got the name changed to Muirfield. Muirfield. And there, I believe there's still a letter exists where Muirfield in Scotland agreed to allow us to use the name. Gave it their blessing. Yeah, but we weren't to use it for any gain. No commercial purpose, just to have it as the name of the club. So um, anyhow, I was left uh, Spence and Spring and went to work for Bertie Alfield up in Hunter Street. Mm-hmm. He had a store there and I was teaching there. Sounds competitive in the city, Tom. Oh, so how many, five, how many five golf shops in the city? Yeah. It would be Nirvana. In this day and age, it's hard to imagine five golf shops in the city, isn't it? Yeah. What a different time. Well, there you are. And um, anyhow, I met a girl, or I re-met a girl that I had known two or three years before. And um, I was going up Hunter Street one morning and she was coming down. So I I spoke to her and we had a talk and... uh, finished up and said, well, look, why don't we have tea somewhere? And we went and had tea at one of the many little restaurants in town then. And um, now that was in September 53, right? And um, the next weekend was the long weekend, eight-hour weekend. Mm -hmm. And um, I had nothing to do, so I caught the bus out to Bob and Head Mm-hmm. And I walked around to Apple Tree Bay and then up to Mount Karingai where I had a, a, some friends who lived up there. And um, whilst I was there, I said, uh, I'm going to get married. And they said, oh, here's the girl, I told them. Where does she live? Well, I didn't know where she <laughs> And they said, well, when do you think? I said, well, <laughs> Before Christmas. This is in September? No, this is our uh, weekend, our first weekend in October. Right. So, um, Did she know uh, yet? Doesn't sound like it. No. At <laughs> any rate, um, the romance blossomed, you might say, and um, she couldn't get ready until the April 54. And when I told Bertie, I was going, oh, no, he said, that's not, not a good plan because uh, Easter time, a lot of my country clients come down and want to be busy. busy. And I said, well, if that's the case, I'll have to hand my resignation in, which I did. Wow. And um, on the oh, that was on the Saturday. On the Monday, I went down to the PGA office and see if there was any um, jobs available. I said, well, there's a rough course out at North Rocks, <laughs> and we'll send you down to see there. Solicitor. There's a fellow named Alan Uther. And they were big solicitors in Sydney. And um, I talked to him, and he sent me down to the 
president of Muirfield, a fellow named David Hine, who had an office in Sussex Street, I think. So I got talking to him, and he said, yeah, and it's going to be a great club, and, you know, you're a bit rough to start with, but you know, uh, get a foot foothold in. So I went round and bought some stock, and I was to start on the Saturday week. And the next I'll get a telegram, start Saturday. So I was out of work for five days. <laughs> and was that the last time you were out of work before you retired, Tom? That was the only time the I was ever out of work in my life. life. My goodness. I just want to go back, Tom. We'll come back to some of the golf stuff. What was the world like? What was Sydney like at that time during the war? What was life like? Well, we were young, I suppose, and it didn't really affect us a great mm-hmm. deal. Um, you probably didn't know anything different, I suppose, in some ways. Um, I was in the Scouts at that time too, and we every every once a month we'd go around and collect all the uh, papers and what have you for the uh, recycling. And um, I remember you could only buy red meat, like steak, on a Thursday morning. So... Why was that? Was it a ration? Yeah, ration. Right, right. So uh, to get to school, I had to get a train about seven minutes past eight from Hornsby. Mm-hmm. So I would uh, get the order, race up to the butcher, get the steak or red meat, race back home, get my school bag, race up and see if I could get the seven minutes past eight train. And that was your Thursday morning Ritual. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And quite often I'd miss the train of course. <laughs> Where have you been, Moore? What? I missed the last train, sir. Well, how did you get in? You caught the next one. <laughs> but, um, that was all. That was North Sydney Tech. What was golf coverage like? Do you remember? Did you hear about golf on the radio or did you see it in the papers? Were there magazines available? What yeah. was the media like around golf at that time? Well, in those days, most leading papers had a designated sports writer, mm-hmm. maybe a, a designated uh, golf writer. Mm-hmm. And the results went in every Sunday morning, of course. The club competition club. results, yeah. And any uh, pro events were widely uh, covered. How many professional events might you see in Sydney, say, in the course of a year? At oh, that time? you'd see probably 12 what they used to call um, pro purses. Right. Like the... Um, Roseville Gold Mashie. Uh-huh, which still goes to this day. And the Eleonora Pro-Am and uh, the Royal Sydney Cup. The one-day events? Mostly one-day, uh, 36 holes, though. Yeah. And, um, it's a tough gig around Roseville, isn't it? 36 holes oh, on mate. foot in one day. I used to hate it, <laughs> Roseville. And, um, but there was money, Tom, and if you're a professional yeah, and there's a purse right. on, you play, don't you? Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. what you do. Kalara had one, Pimble had one. Mm-hmm. Um, Would they get crowds to an event like that? Would people um, come out to watch? Not huge crowds, but uh, of course the the first big match I ever saw was the Australian Open in '49 at Kensington. Mm-hmm. Ossie Pickworth was, I think he was four sh- four shots ahead with nine to go, mm. and Eric Kremen got a string of birdies and uh, finished up. There was a huge lake near the what's now the ninth green, mm-hmm. and still there, and it was uh, casual water. But a Ozzie, lake? Yeah. Casual water for a, a lake. lake? Wow. And Ozzie didn't know this. He put his second shot in the water. He thought it was a hazard, mm-hmm. so he teed up again, put another one in there, and he was eventually disqualified for signing a wrong scorecard. Because he proceeded under the incorrect rule by yes, teeing right. up again and yeah. hitting from that spot. Wow, you were there on the ground. Only, only watching. Yeah, yeah, watching. That's remarkable. Yes, that must have been an extraordinary controversy at the time. It Tom. was, yeah. Oh, yeah. Another game they had. So Eric Kremen won the title? Yeah, yeah. Almost by default, by the yeah, sound of it. Because Ozzy Pickworth, of course, my goodness, I can't believe you got to see him play. What a legendary name he was in Australia. Yeah, he, uh, he was um, a natural swinger and. Uh, the first shot I saw him play, he was in a bit of a dip on the 18th, what's the 18th fairway now, and he was on the downslope. 
and it was a bit grassy, it was weedy grass about, and he took a wood and he hit this ball and it went about that high off the ground through this grass. I thought, geez, he's topped it. But when it got through the grass, it took off. off. And uh, he was a great putter. What were the courses like then, Tom? What was the condition like? We, of course, yeah. see the Australian now in the Australian Open. Well, the hosted green, there. You could eat off the fairways. This so amazing. And the greens were, you know, the top courses were perfect. They were New Zealand brown top bent. Mm-hmm. And they were oh, absolutely glorious to pitch to and to putt on. Fast greens or? Uh, yes, not as fast as they are today, though. Perhaps standard club level standard greens yeah. that we see in this stage would have been would have been considered fast at the time. And did you get to play many of those bigger events, the four round events, the Open, and some yeah, of those well, other ones? You had to uh, qualify. Mm-hmm. I played in uh, quite a few. I played the first two rounds. And didn't qualify for the weekend, mm-hmm. but I did manage to win the uh, Royal Sydney Cup. That was about nineteen fifty. Seven. Mm-hmm. That's quite prestigious, the Royal Sydney Cup. Well, it was. You played thought. one round on Saturday and two rounds on the holiday Monday. Oh, so you had the day off in the middle, <laughs> Sunday. What sort of field size? How many pros would have teed up in that? Oh, match? 40. Of course, at the time, the professionals playing the tournaments were the same professionals who'd turn up at the golf club on Monday, wouldn't they, to, to be the, the club professional. That was common. Yeah. In fact, a to be a touring professional, if I'm not wrong, you had to have an attachment to yep, a golf club for many years. Yep. And uh, the Von was a wandering player, mm-hmm. and he had to get himself at, sort of attached to Kalara as the playing pro, because a lot of overseas events you had to be a, had to be attached. a PGA member. Now I remember Mike Clayton telling me as late as perhaps the 1970s. Yeah. The trainee professionals or apprentice professionals yeah. weren't entitled to win any money in professional events That's until right. they'd been a member for some yeah. five years, maybe, no, or, so, or no. three years. No, no, Mike was about the beginning of um, the uh, uh, fellows getting into the professional players' ranks, but they weren't entitled to take a club job. Right. So there was a bit of a division mm-hmm. fairly early on about. Yeah. That, now, of course, they're two very distinct jobs, aren't they? Yeah. Two completely different jobs. But right. it's not hard to imagine there was a time when they would have been the same people would have been both playing and managing sort of club shops. Was there much in the way? When did it become feasible for a young apprentice professional to perhaps think to himself, I might play the game for a living rather than work at a club? When did that become realistic? Um, well, that didn't come in until – Probably the sixties, early seventies. Uh, fellas like uh, Bobby, um, he was a, he was a, he was a really good golfer. Bob, not Bob Stanton. Yeah, Bob oh, Stanton. You okay. got the first. A really good golfer might understand it. He had quite a special gift, as I understand it. Bob, yeah, that's right. The game. And um, Roger Davis had a bit of a go, but he didn't do any any good in the early days. What about for recreational golfers? What did golf look like at the time? My Assumption would be there wouldn't have been as much public access golf as we have now through resort courses and whatnot. Was it more common to be a member at a golf club if uh, you were a golfer? That was your aim, to become a member of a club. When you became a member of a club, you tried to get into the grade team uh, or if you became a um, champion, you were eligible to play in other events. But um, No, there there, that was your idea to become a, a member of a club and play with them. And what sort of standard is the wrong word? Were golfers of that era, on average, better, worse, or the same as what we no, see? Now, do you think? No, there was very few good players. There were a lot of players around, but not very, very good. And a, a scratch handicap at that time oh, was an yeah. extraordinary feat to achieve, wasn't it? That's right. Uh, you had to if you apply. want to scratch your boy. You were a professional, essentially, who'd chosen yeah. not to play, perhaps, for a living. That's right. No, they were very hard on amateurs accepting money. Mm-hmm. You'd get thrown out very quickly. Mm-hmm. And um, um, handicaps were very r- strictly... Yeah, it was a very different sort of system, wasn't it? it was, so, was that... 
was that time and that system, was that better time or worse or just different? How do you look back on that now? Well, it was different. The pros in the country, they really generally suffered with the weather. Maybe a good, if they had good seasons, they'd do quite well. But other times they'd, they wouldn't make much money at all. Like farming? Yeah. Tom. Well, so there was a big movement of pros around the countryside. They would go to a club and stay from a few months, 12 months, and nothing here, move on. Move on to somewhere else. Because, of course, at this time, if we're talking sort of the 40s and the 50s, the PGA is quite a young organisation, isn't it? It, it was. It was. 1911, I think, they were founded. So yeah, only 40 right. years old, one generation of yeah. players, I suppose. And uh, they had no real power. Um, clubs would try and um, perhaps go through the PGA to get a, a pro of their club. But they uh, they didn't always adhere to that. And then along came the government. I'll never forget this. We um, we had a pro at um, Wagga uh, Wagga Country Club down by the lake, and he left. So they wrote to us and said, would we send another pro down, you know, send some applicants down. So were you part of the PGA administration at this time? Oh, when I was, you say yeah. Us? Right. And uh, we said, what's the retainer? And they said, it's 10, 10 quid a week. And we said, it was 10 quid a week five years ago. We think you would have put it up. And they said, no way, we'll tell you pros what we'll pay, and that's it. So we said, well, look, we're not going to advertise it, and encourage our members to go down there. And the next thing I, I get a call, and some bloke from the government. He said, what do you think you're doing? And I said, well, we're trying to see that these blokes don't starve. And he said, well, you better change that, because otherwise you'll get fined $250 a day, I think it was. For what? For trying to... Um, dictate uh, free uh, trade. This was at a time when um, retail sales, retail price maintenance came into. What 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 sort of a year was this? What year do you recall? Uh, this was in the sixties. In the sixties, okay. And uh, any rate, we certainly changed our uh, thinking when he when he said this. Um, but um, we weren't keen to send blokes out to Werris Creek or Morundi or somewhere else and let them starve. No. But uh, the government said it's a free country. You, you can do what you like. Yeah, well, so, so, i.e. free country to not advertise the position if we choose not to. Thank you very much. So uh, <laughs> we... Um, we didn't try to tell clubs what they had to pay, but we did on occasions um, not encourage our members to. Right, because the PGA is a it's a union of sorts, isn't it? But not a not in the traditional sense. No, it it, um, it didn't have a lot of power, and um, in fact, in a, in a club position, the pro was. Virtually one step above a caddy. Yeah. And what was the – was there a standard relationship between a club and a professional in terms of payment and money? Was there a, an arrangement that you could say was standard? And what would what would that look like? Generally, we would ask the retainer to be the cost of one employee mm -hmm. so that he would have someone there in case he was sick or wanted a day off or something like that. And that worked pretty well. And then a percentage of what was sold or all profit of what was no, sold? No, or? it was all his risk and profit. And uh, But you didn't have all these discounts to us. Didn't have the off-course retailers to compete with. And, uh, actually, at uh, one stage there, I was uh, selling Nibelik shoes and I would um, buy in 20 or 30 shoes get the invoice out, add 60%, and that was the retail price. And That's there was no argument. Price, no argument, right? 
And when did that start to change? Because, of course, there, for a long period of time, if you wanted to buy golf equipment, mm. well, you had stores in the city, as you say, but they were run by PJ, but they weren't the discount no. chain ideas, were no. they? They were. When did that sort of start to change? Um, was it a good business being a club professional? It was in that way. You could make good money? You could, yeah. If you were smart. Yeah. Your um, lessons were uh, quite, quite all good. People wanting to learn. So um, you had to work at it. What sort of hours would you have averaged, do you think, over um, your career? Oh, gee. On a week. Um, week. I would uh, probably do uh, 80 hours a week. And would that have been normal? That would be normal. That no, would, no days off in there, I assume. No. If you're going to fit in 80 hours, you better be here every day because it's more than 10 hours a day, isn't it? Yeah, well... It wasn't all hard work. I mean, some of the time you were doing book work. That was all left to... Some of us find that very hard work. Some of us yeah, find well, the book work harder than the actual yeah, work, Tom. Yeah, so. that's right. So, um, but you, you did it because you loved it. You know, you were really besotted with golf and you know, all, all of it. I wonder sometimes whether people appreciate that. You, you really have devoted your life to the game and to the PGA, the organisation, haven't you? You're yeah. a life member yeah. of the PGA. Yeah. And how, I hate to ask this, how old are you now, Tom? You still look 60, which is, I think, how well, old you were when I, I met you. I 88 last month. I still can't believe it. You look amazingly well. So you've been involved with the PGA for, how old were you when you, over 70 years? Yeah, over 70 years. I can't think of too many industries where that might be the case. No. But um, at one stage there, I thought this uh, clubs are treating us virtually like slaves, and um, when you when you one slave died, you just brought up another one out of the chains and put him in, and, uh, and uh, pros were being replaced. And, Very much like one of those big oar ships, you know, where blacks are yeah, on the oars and when one goes down, down pull him out and throw another one in. Is that part of what motivated you to um, to become involved in the administration of the PGA? Just come a bit closer. Well, no, um, it was just a natural sort of follow-on. You felt you wanted to add whatever you could to the... Uh, to the it would have been a smaller organisation then too, I assume. There would have oh, been yeah. a lot less people both to be administrators and to be administered. There would That's have been right. less, a smaller, so, um, smaller number. Um, I thought I might be able to add something and I became uh, a director mm-hmm. and eventually became uh, chairman. And uh, uh, they're thankless jobs, of course. The... Uh, uh, I became chairman uh, one Christmas time, virtually because Col Johnson was m- moving up to Sugar Valley, and he was chairman. He left, and then I was I was elected chairman. Sure, that was their Christmas gift to you. Yeah. To Merry Christmas! You could be chairman now, and so, all that comes with it. <laughs> our annual meeting then was in March, and I said to the secretary, "How are we travelling?" Oh, he said, it'll be about a line ball. Well, it turned out that we lost 3,000 um, 3, pounds, I think, for the year. Well, at the general meeting, I got money of sale from all, all around. Me. So then things started to pick up and we got a lot of pro-ams. And, of course, we got the entry fees from pro-ams. And the next year... We made fifteen thousand pounds. Right. Well, I got assailed again for not giving all this money back to the members. <laughs> so uh, you can't win in those roles, can you? you can't. Sometimes that's probably yeah. still true somewhat yeah. today. That's right. Where yeah. did at, at that time could you have looked ahead and seen? It'd be hard to see how the world has developed, wouldn't it, and how the PGA might fit. How do you feel about how golf and the organisation? sort of fits into modern society. It's very different from the times you've been describing about when you grew up. and yeah. It's a very different game, isn't it? A very different well, business. Uh, we just had a, a dinner 
where we presented the uh, certificates to a lot of new members, mm-hmm. and they were nearly all in their late twenties, mm-hmm. early thirties. There are no more of these eighteen-year-olds, really. And of course, a lot of them were girls too. And why do you think that is? Why? Why um, later in life, though? Well, in the uh, early seventies, I moved a motion at general meeting that ladies be accepted as members. And I was held down. And sailed from every side again. <laughs> yeah. But, so you've um, always been a troublemaker then, right from the very beginning? Well, um, you know, things weren't all that good. and They could be better. And um, I reckon that a pro should have a, um, a, a position at a club that he could sell. But that went down like a lead balloon too. Why was it? Well, first thing says, why were you a supporter of women becoming members? As you say, it's, it clearly wasn't the common thought no. of the day. Why were well, you in favour of it? Well, there's nothing really that goes on in a pro shop that a, a woman can't do, can't do. a strong girl. Mm-hmm. And um, they were starting then to um, play good golf. A lot of them were we're playing good golf, and um, I guess Tom, what's happened in a in a funny way is that what happened to golf professionals in clubs in the seventies, eighties, and nineties, when mm. off course mm. discount shops became quite popular, is happening to off course discount shops with international sellers now. A lot of people buy their golf equipment over the internet, yeah, from outside Australia. Yeah. It's a similar sort of thing. I wonder what role the nature of golf clubs. Plays out. I mean, the, the playing implements, the clubs we play with. In the 50s and 60s, as I understand it, when you went to get a new golf club, that was quite a big deal, but somebody would make it for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very different experience to what we have now, isn't it? Tell me about making golf clubs and and how that made the game perhaps. I feel like we've lost a lot of romance with oh, the equipment. Yeah. yeah, there's no. Um there's no soul in it at all now. It's just they're just things. Mm. And um, there's a new one every six months. Yeah. So you made clubs and you, yeah. you took square cubes of persimmon wood. Yeah. You crafted them. Yeah. With your own hands yeah. in the shop here at Muirfield. Yeah. Into drivers and three woods and yeah. shaped them, yeah. stained them, put the face plates on. Did they have you? They would have had your name on them. Yeah, that's right. Those so, clubs. What was that, that process like? That must have been. Well, I would measure you up, um, watch your hit balls, of course and um, make the club, but, but then you could try it out, and if it wasn't good, you could alter it. In what way? What could you alter about it? Well, you could alter the weight, you could alter the length, you could shape the face, give you a bit more um, loft, and you could alter the... The, the lie angle? The lie of the club. How could you alter the lie angle on a wooden-headed club? It well, doesn't you'd, make any sense. No, you'd... You'd shave, if you wanted a bit flatter, you'd shave the, the heel. heel. Okay. And if you wanted to sit up that way, you'd shave, shave. the toe. And, and with fitting golf clubs, so you said you'd watch somebody swing, mm. and then it would be your professional instinct plus knowledge plus eye that you would then go and build something yeah, for them or make, right. that you thought would work for them. Yeah. So um, that, that's a beautiful see, way to buy golf clubs, Tom. That's a process, isn't it? How long would that take? If I came to you on a Tuesday and I said to you, I want to buy a new driver, and we did the fitting part then, hit the balls, when would I get my new driver? Um, three weeks to a month, I'd say. Okay. But you were prepared to wait. Well, it's going to be mine, sure. That's right. Wait for me. That's right. And would people buy sets at that time? Would I buy a driver, a three-wood and a five-wood, or a one, two, three, four? Would I just buy the driver? Was there a was there common? Well, or did people do all sorts of different things. No, it's not had a, a, a T T club and a fairway club. That was pretty much the so driver three would drive a four would drive a two would maybe two wooden forward for yes, some people. Right. And did you recommend what clubs people should have? Whether they should be using a driver or maybe a two wood is more suited to them? Was that part of it? Oh yeah, you see, um, if they got the um, face of the club closed, as we say, at the top of the swing. 
from the face of the club pointing to the sky, generally when they got back to the ball, the club would be shut and you, the ball wouldn't rise. Go low. They did low. You couldn't get up off the ground. So um, you try and work his swing, to fix his swing. But um, <clears throat> um, you couldn't make a club really that would fit that. You'd have to change his swing. Right. Now, um, yeah. But it was um, one of those things. To make up one club would take you a couple of weeks, but it would take the same time to make up six clubs. Right. Do more ones, stain them and polish them. And so at any them. given time in the back room here at Muirfield, I imagine you would have had lined up on a bench yeah. 5, 10, 15, maybe 20 heads at various stages of manufacture. And yeah, that's right. Some finished and drying and others just started. The what sort of tools did you work with? How did you? I know that you've told me about I think you might have even run a couple of classes of teaching people how to shape a persimmon yeah, club. Yeah, mostly with a, a half-round rasp or a half-round file and um, put the block of wood in the vice and away you go. Away you go. Right. That's a completely that, – that's a skill that's totally unrelated to the playing of golf. And yet I imagine every golf professional – would have been capable of doing that, or oh or yeah, not? yeah, that would have been part of his training apprenticeship. Apprenticeship, and he would have to do a, a um, test at the end of it. Mm -hmm. And um, wow, my goodness, what a different time! Because of course, now if I wanted to go and get fitted for a golf club, now they'd put a little electronic device behind me that looks like a, a small TV, yeah, and they'd stand at the screen. And that would tell them all sorts of yeah. things and they'd probably fit me with a club that meant they didn't have to change my swing and neither did I. <laughs> it would just do the work for me yeah. in some ways. What do you think about that? Well, that's technology and you can't stop it, I don't think. Have you, what have you noticed that's changed about the golf? Has the golf swing changed? We were just talking about it being a more aerial game. I think that's true at all levels, isn't it, including it? the amateur level, you would see different sort of golf here at Muirfield now than yeah. when you started as the professional yeah. here. Has the swing itself changed to accommodate that? Well, do you think? Because the um, the elite players are so fit and they're using muscles that we never thought we had. We, you know, so um, to bring those big muscles into play uh, is a great um, advantage. Mm -hmm. So... The idea of the swing hasn't changed much. You take the club back and bring it through. Two turns and a swish, I think, as Palmer <laughs> described it all those years ago. Yeah. So, um, um, so the actual swing can't change a great deal, but um, speed of it certainly has at the top level. Yeah. Uh, for those of us who play recreationally and not particularly, the, the double-digit handicapper, is there anything about, let's call it old golf, for want of a better term, in, in air quotes there, old golf, is there anything about that that we could learn from and, and take? I feel the ground game, as you were discussing, is, is probably something that most recreational golfers, if they thought more about running the ball on the ground than in the air, that might improve their game more often. Well, um I get the uh, chance to look at some kids and from now and then, and I throw the whole set of clubs on the ground, and I get about twenty yards off the green, and I say, "Now you've got to put this ball onto that green near the flag with any one of those clubs, from a putter, sand iron, driver." And I, I believe that if they're going to really enjoy their golf, They'll have to be able to do that with any club in the bag. Whereas, um, um, you don't see, uh, many of these elite players, uh, playing a low shot, running onto the green, nearly always, uh, the wedge, 60, 70 degree wedge or whatever, and have something chung chung. Uh, so, uh, we had to learn to play also, uh, half shots and three quarter shots. 
Well, they, they've gone pretty much now because they've just got a club for every um, Dialed in. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the word joy and young people enjoying the game. Is Do you feel golf is a less fun, it's probably the wrong way to go, a less fun pursuit in modern times than it was perhaps previously, or have I or no, have always been people who at a club were level, cranky? It should be it should be made enjoyable, and um, you can do this by various types of games. But, um, um, I think uh, for starters, all clubs should um, look at. Um, the older people in, the, in their club put some tees forward or put all the tees forward for them and have a, a separate game because as fellas here it can't reach the fairway from the tee. Yeah, but they're golfers, Tom. You and I both know that if you put a forward tee there, they'll refuse to use it, <laughs> won't well, they? <laughs> well, what they're doing here mostly is giving up, mm. which is uh, that... That's a, that's a tragedy, really, isn't it? Well, it is. And it, it cuts the um, financial side of it down too, because most of those old blokes will come in and have a drink after. And um, so, um, golf's more than just a business, though, isn't it? It certainly has been. It's been your business, but it's been more than a business, hasn't it? Isn't that is that true of a lot of the? You think of the older members here. I would imagine it's been more than just a something to do on a Saturday for them. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, well, if we take golf, it, it has a, a very large s- sphere, hasn't it? From golf course architecture to um, club making, teaching and playing. It's uh, so vast that uh, it should interest any golfer. And it's not restricted by age or gender. Mm-hmm. That's right. Five-year-olds can play and yeah. 95-year-olds can play. Yeah. If you wanted to this afternoon, you could go out there at 88 and play with a 10-year-old yep. and both enjoy the game. It's yep. an incredibly – it's a game of few boundaries in so many ways, isn't it? But, but I feel like we place a lot of boundaries on it. We play so much competition golf in Australia. We think a, a golf course has to have four par fives and four par threes. Yeah. We kind of interfere with golf in ways that aren't. Great for the game, aren't they? Because yeah. you can make it whatever you want golf, can't you? You can. You can. So, was um, it like that in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s? Were people very regimented about how they went about golf or was there more freedom? No, much more freedom. And um, the, um, very few clubs, very good courses, um, had holes where you had to play across a lake. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was nearly always a way to bounce the ball on the green. And you can see them now. I see them on the TV. And they hit a six iron, 204 yards. And it comes down onto a hard green. Stops, stop. like, stops like a wedge. Yeah. And this um, is... Um, making it easier for those blokes because they can aim in at the hole, can't they? What part do you think – Did you have, have you seen a change with agronomy and the way courses are presented within the way the game is played? I, I would assume that in the 40s, 50s and 60s, for the most part, fairway irrigation wasn't standard, so right. fairways were probably firmer and mm-hmm. lies perhaps weren't as uniformly good. That's right. That all – changes the way you play the game, doesn't it? Well, uh, these days they jazz the courses up so that they're nearly all the same. You know, the fairways are perfect, the greens are running at 10. With the courses less pristine, is, oh. that, a, is that a different game, do you think? Oh, that? absolutely. Yeah. You, um, you, you lie on the fairway, you were lucky to get a a decent lie, and um, then, of course, your, your, your greens, some were hard, some were soft, and um, it, um, that's where a good caddy would come into it. And you'd, uh, but you'd need, to, you'd need to think more what you're trying to do. 
Speaking of golf courses, you would have played, I imagine, probably all over the world. Yep. What sorts of golf courses and what are the golf courses that you think in your life have been the most fun to play? Is there a particular type or is it a mixed bag of different styles of golf? No, uh, well, um, down in Melbourne on the morning of the peninsula, they've got a lot of courses that were made before bulldozers came in and they wander through the sand hills of nature. And the nearer you can get to a natural position, I reckon, the better. But um, I used to love playing at a place called Sorrento. Mm -hmm. Thompson's. Home yeah. club, or it was his home club late in life, if I'm not mistaken, was it not? Sorrento, Peter Thompson. He played there a lot, yeah. And um, but uh, Royal Sydney was always one of my favourites in the old days. Um, as you say, there was no fairway watering. You could get a decent uh, lie on the fairway, and the greens were beautiful. It's and, a very different course to what we know now, isn't it? Oh, so yeah, it's a very I, different course. I think they've stuffed it up. Mm. So, well, they're, they're redoing it, Well, they, uh, it seems. There's some argument about this. Yes, I know. There's <laughs> some they, contention. Uh, we might not put this in the podcast. Or we'll both get in trouble. It was a much more open. Both that and the Australian were much more open golf courses in the past. Oh, yeah. They had much less trees, a lot more sandy. Yeah. Probably looked a bit more like the Mornington Peninsula than what we yeah. see now, yeah. a very different sort of golf. Oh, yeah. What about the Sandbelt? Have you played much down there, Royal Melbourne and Kingston Heath oh, and those yeah. places? Um, there, I always played better in Melbourne because when you stood on the tee, you could nearly always see what you were up to. Mm -hmm. And the, at the corner of the fairway, they would put a bunker so that you knew it was going it's that returned. way. Mm -hmm. And um, they, uh, the greens down there, of course, is... Are really beautiful. Although Royal Melbourne um, have got these quite large greens, so that the the rolls are, are quite manageable. A lot of clubs have tried to copy this, made the greens too small, mm -hmm. and therefore the ball runs all over the place. It's got a scale to it, Royal yeah. Melbourne, doesn't yeah. it? It's a grand golf course. You. Yeah. Yeah. When you stand and look from the tees and you look into the greens, the big sweeping sort of scale, hasn't it? It's a oh, wonderful. Yeah. I find it quite special. I've always loved Royal Melbourne. I'd go and watch 15 markers play at Royal Melbourne. I think it would be entertaining because the course is just such a, a special sort of a place. Who have been some of the best players that you've seen over the years, Tom, and played with? I imagine you must have played with some pretty good, pretty yeah. handy players in your time. Oh, yeah. Um, well, you had Eric Kremen, as I say, and Ozzy Pickworth. And the Vaughan. Did you play much with Von Knight? You would have seen No, I only ever played actually one or two rounds with the Vaughan. And um, he, was, he was very good. How did his game compare to sort of the club professionals that you would have played with more regularly? Was it much different or? Yeah, he was far ahead. As in longer or just had more shots or? Um, he was quite long off the team. <laughs> But um, he shots to the pin with, uh, like with a four iron, he'd be looking to put it six feet from the half. Right. Wow. That's it's a game with which I'm not familiar, Tom. I don't know about you. <laughs> but he, um, he always impressed me that he took an extra club so he didn't have to hit it too hard. What are some of those secrets that good golfers like yourself know that, we recreational players never seem to learn the lesson. I feel like hit, trying to hit the ball too hard is probably one yeah. that people suffer from for a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the others, perhaps? Um, well, they were the uh, the best. Ferrier had uh, gone to America, but um, apart from the Bond, Pickworth, Kremen, and um, they were at the top. Did you get to see Peter Thompson play much? Uh, yeah, he was um, he was not a very impressive player. Tom, he was more a calculated player, but he uh, he got it around. 
Very elegant looking golf swing, I've always thought. Mm -hmm. A very elegant looking golf swing, a, a nice sort of a rhythm yeah. to it, nice yeah. pace to it. He never it appeared to be belting. No. <laughs> but he, was, he was sneaky long. Mm -hmm. um, but then you had fellas coming through like Frankie Phillips. He was long, wasn't he, Frank Phillips? Well, you know, we talk about long, but if he were good at out 280 yards, he was, yeah. that was it, you know. And, um, and Jack Harris was another one. And then... Uh, Devlin came into the scene, and uh, Bob Stanton. Did and you see Bob Stanton play? People well, say I, he was just gifted, yeah, naturally gifted. Yeah, good, good. He had everything going for him. Yeah. But, uh, Extraordinary talent. Oh, unbelievable. Uh, Jimmy, Mor Jim Moran was a very good player too. Mm -hmm. uh, and what, the, what makes the – there's a lot of good players, obviously, and there's a lot of people in the world who can hit the ball very well. There's a lot of people who can putt well and who can chip well, but there aren't many people who can truly play golf in all of the facets. What separates them, do you think, Tom? It's, um, in my view, a, a champion golfer can lift. I mean, uh, when, they're, when they're playing at the top of their form, they can do great things, but sometimes you... Um, your game slips through one thing or another, and it's those blokes can change things and and lift. Turn seventy four into seventy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Jack Newton was one. He he could always he playing badly, but he could always lift. Whereas Tony Jacklin, I felt he could only play at one level, mm -hmm. and that was. That was his level. And if he was playing great, good, if he was playing badly. That was it. Know. He'd be playing badly. Yeah. I remember that Dan Cullen once told me that he could watch a fellow walk from the pro shop to the first tee and he'd be able to tell you by the time he arrived whether he could play golf or not. Mm -hmm. Do you reckon that's true? Have you got that skill? Do you know what he means by that, Dan? Yeah, you can, uh, yeah, you, you can see by his movement. After he told me that, I was too embarrassed to get up and walk out of his house. Yeah. <laughs> he'd be able to see that I can't play golf at all. Yeah. But, uh, to see him like swing the club and say, well, he's got an idea of it. And um, in the old days, the captain of the club generally was a handicapper. and Because there was no national handicapping system, no. there, was there? It was all done at the club. And he only had to play around with a bloke. Say, well, he's a scratch marker, he's a four marker, he's an eight marker, he's a, he's a uh, 20 marker. You, know, um, you can soon pick it. And, uh, we had good amateurs too, Hattersley and all those fellas, Picks as well. Keith Picks was the only man that ever told me that he'd beaten golf. Right. No one has ever said that to me. What, what context? What context did he say that to? Because I think most of us as golfers would be terrified. We've all had fleeting moments where we might have thought we'd be, but we'd never verbalise it because that's asking for trouble, no, isn't it? That was the sort of bloke he was. How, what did he mean by that? Do you think? Well, I, I never worked it out. But, uh, I was quite shocked. Tell me that story again. I remember you told me the story once. How? As it, I think you were you were an apprentice or a trainee, and it was is that right? And you used to cut the ends off the hickory shafts. Tell me what what happened there. What used to happen? Well, all your um, stir shafts came into one length, and you you could cut the the tip off if you wanted to make it stiffer, mm -hmm. or you could cut the butt off if you wanted to make it shorter, and then if you want to make it longer, you put those plugs in. And the hickory was the best wood you could possibly get for those plugs. It was beautiful wood. So um, I cut up many hundreds of hickory shafts to do that. Just clubs that were lying around the back of the pro yeah, shop that, uh, for whatever reason? Yeah. But... Um, and then one day, what happened? Well, we were in England and Scotland to be exactly. We were going to castles and cathedrals and they never threw anything out 
And I thought, now, wait a minute. We keep throwing all this stuff out. Fifty years' time, someone's going to say, Tom, where's all our history? Yeah. You know, shot to bits. So I started saving. And as people got to know that, they started bringing stuff in. <laughs> now you couldn't get away from it. <laughs> now, um, um, I always imagined that I would have a, a, a site where I could display it all, and um, that came about in the 90s with uh, Dennis Brosnan, who gave us that area up above his shop. Um, I was at Granville, wasn't it? The Granville, golf yeah. at Granville. And uh, at the moment, he's closed the store down, so we've had to get out of there. Yeah. All our stuff is in uh, storage, but we're trying to do a deal with Strathfield. Golf club. Yeah, golf club. They've got this huge new clubhouse, and there is a, a space there if they so desire to let us have it. If you could have your choice, because a, a golf history museum, we don't really have a proper one in Australia. There are a couple of clubs that have got important artefacts and rooms. Royal Sydney, I think, has some some really important artefacts of the game, as do Royal Melbourne and no doubt other clubs. But there's no one place, is there, in Australia where you can go and sort of see the history of the game. And that's what you had yeah. there yeah, at, right. at, at Granville. If you had your choice... No restrictions. You could put it wherever you want. Where would you put a golf museum in Australia? Well, is a is a golf club the right place for it? Or? No, no. Very few clubs want people wandering through their their um, signing room. Um, Sorry, I know it's uncomfortable. I, I would. I, uh, I'd put it at Moor Park. I would too. There's a lovely old sandstone building down there, and. We could, uh, so if you want to try and hit these balls, just nip up to the driving range and or, and it's all there. There's parking there. It would take, we'd need a million bucks to really do it out as we wanted it. But uh, everyone you speak to say, oh, you, you know, you're, you're doing a good job. Well, you know, what about you take out a sponsorship? Oh, well, you know... I'm not quite ready for that. <laughs> Sorry, you're not doing that good a job. <laughs> no, not a good enough job for me to pay for it, but surely somebody else should. Yeah. Is it important, Tom? I, well, I feel like we don't pay history, any of our history, not just golf. We don't pay any of it as much attention as we should, and I wonder whether the older we get, the more we, the more we think that. I think when I was a young bloke, I never gave it a thought. No, no neither did I. Um, and I can't see that... The clubs that we're using in the last 20, 30 years, whether they're going to be of any value uh, in the future, like the hickory shaft, were they uh, become quite disposable. Golf, hasn't it, in that yeah, way? Disposable. Golf clubs. Uh, landfill. So, um, anyhow, um, we'll just keep the collection together. And That's the danger, isn't it, that it's like... Well, so here again, uh, sometimes we get a call from Melbourne and they say, well, we want to put it down here. And I say, well, that's where we'll go. You've got the money and the wherewithal. But people say, we're not going to Melbourne, not having anything to do with those bloody Melbourne people. They want to take over everything. Well, if they've got the money and the position... Politics is, yes, um, yes, right. is everything, doesn't it, Tom? Oh, for us, so. Golf clubs all the way up to countries. Politics yes. is... You must have been playing it your whole life, I suppose, being a club professional and part of the PGA. It's it's inescapable, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um... Here's a question. What's that? Is your wife able to park her car in your garage yet? Because <laughs> she once told me... When you bought your house, she thought that there's a nice garage there I can park my car in it, but that fairly quickly it was full of old golf clubs yeah. and that that never changed. No. Has it changed yet? No. <laughs> Still full of old golf clubs? Yeah, probably so. <laughs> um, yeah, probably so. What would you like to happen? I, I imagine some of it's probably valuable, but some of it's probably just not valuable in the sense of it's made by someone and so it's got a dollar value, but it's all valuable in a sense, isn't it? And you've gone to quite a bit of trouble to collect an awful lot of that. What would you like to see happen to it? Well, 
you know, somebody's got to take the bull by the horns, as I say. Like, um, if Greg Norman said, I want it up in Queensland, there's $4 million, that's where it'll go. Uh, but it should be collected and stored and it's shown at some some place. It's just money, isn't it, Tom? That's all oh, it takes. Yeah. It's just money. Yeah. You've never given up on that, have you? You've it would have been easy to, I imagine, at times over the years, oh, yeah. given up on the notion of, but you never have. No. Why not? Um, Even now, you're 88, Tom. You could 88. Give up now, couldn't you? <laughs> um, oh no, I haven't. Um, I haven't become obsessed with it. I've rather let let it grow, and. Um, Quite a few people encouraged me, and uh, they're all good blokes. And uh, see, Edgar Oakman uh, lives down at Barrow now. He gave me a collection of really valuable clubs, and uh, he just gave them to us. He said to me years ago that was his superannuation, but then he realised that he wasn't going to do anything with them. And, there's no market for them and such, so uh, he gave them to the museum. And, uh, now they're in storage somewhere, yeah. without a home, and nobody gets to see them. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I reckon Tom's tone at the end there pretty much tells the story. Still lots of work to be done to preserve the history of this great game here in Australia. I hope you enjoyed listening to that chat with Tom as much as I enjoyed recording it, and we can only hope that it might help Tom's dream of an Australian Golf History Museum to become a reality. Certainly there are a lot of good people continuing to do a lot of good work to try to make that happen. That wraps up this episode of Golf Australia's Thing About Golf, but make sure to join us next time when we meet one of Australia's genuinely good blokes, two-time Australian Open champion, Peter Lombard.